you referenced a, a, an amazing number of opportunities that come from the transformation. Can you talk a little bit yeah. more about those? Yeah, the Thank question you. is about the opportunities that come from the transformation. Each transformation, um, because of the new technologies, um, what that does is it devalues what you were able to derive your margins from in the prior economy. So if you remember, back in the 70s when TI introduced the first handheld calculator, it was $1,500. And today there's more computing capacity in a singing birthday card. Um, you remember when, when portable telephones first came out, they were very expensive and only very rich and important people could have them. Um, and now um, cell phones are free. You can't make any money, really, on them. It's all about the apps and everything else on the side. So one of the conditions of a transition, of a transformation, is that you have to, you have to understand that much of what you were deriving your value from loses the ability to, to keep those same margins, those high margins. So you have to look at what are the next value propositions. And, and we call this next economy that we're moving into the meta space economy because the, there are eight value propositions and they are all around some aspect of the dimension that is space. Um, and so I'll run down those very, very quickly for you. Um, this is by itself a five hour lecture, so if you can Strap yourself in again, um, your seat belts. We're going to go very quickly through this. Um, these eight, uh, first I'll run down them and then I'll go back and I'll give you a sentence or two, but I just want you to get the whole picture. They are inner space, outer space, cyberspace, microspace, time space, design space, green to blue space, and storage space. So let's take them one at a time. And the first one is inner space. And that is the, the uh, brain imaging. Uh, let me just back up and say that is what makes living things tick. Um, so whether it's animals, plants, humans, but if we go to humans, it's the brain imaging technology that is rapidly progressing. And that is going to change everything from criminal justice to marketing to healthcare to productivity to you know hiring and firing i mean brain imaging is going to affect everything um, one of the interesting some of the interesting things that have come out of brain imaging um, i talked earlier about the fact that we know that the male and female brains are physiologically distinct from each other um, in many different ways in many different ways um, but we also know for example that um, Financial risk taking, if you image the male brain, financial risk taking and um, sexual addiction um, actually um, light up the same centers of the brain. In the female brain, they are completely separate. So who do you want taking risks with your money? Um, so um, anyway, so we know that from brain imaging, um, we, we're learning a great deal and, and it's already being employed in marketing, you're going to hear about neuroeconomics, neuromarketing, neurobotany, neuro everything. Neuro is going to become a major prefix and it's going to become a, a very high value proposition. Um, the second major growth area and value proposition, um, inner space, outer space. Um, satellites far more underpinning everything we do. You know that Branson already has a list of people who want to go up on the first space shuttles for space um, tourism. Space exploration, even though the United States um, actually is in pretty bad shape there, the rest of the world is moving uh, big time in space exploration. And within the last um, five years, both the Vatican and the History Channel have taken extraterrestrial intelligence very, very seriously. So when that happens, you know something's going on. Um, so outer space is going to be a huge proposition in many ways, in many ways. Then you move to um, microspace, and that is um, nanotechnology and bang fuel. Um, nanotechnology, if I ask you what nanotechnology is, probably some of you have a little idea, but probably no one of you can define it. Nano means billionths of. A nanometer is a billionth, a billionth of a meter, which puts it at the molecular level. A nanosecond is a billionth of a second. Now you can say, you have to be kidding me, a billionth of a second? You know, how can you even conceive of a billionth of a second? Well, in today's environment, that's very slow because we pulse our modern communications in cycles of six to eight femtoseconds, and a femtosecond is a millionth of a billionth of a second. Um, and then at the molecular level, the things that are going on 
we already have things that we call MEMS, microelectromechanical devices, and nanobots. Um, they're already performing in everything from nuclear plants to human bodies. Uh, the idea of nanofabrication, desktop manufacturing is already out there and happening, and there are whole businesses that are going to go out of business the way they do business because of desktop and distributed manufacturing. But the idea of self-fabrication, nano nanofabrication, where um, we can basically instruct atomic particles to build up to the molecular structure, we can have that replicated in lattice formation, which is the way nature would do it, which means that the belief is that through nano self-assembly, we can in the next 10 years grow silk, grow mahogany, grow almost anything. Um, so that's on the nanotechnology side and the bang fuel, which I already told you before, is the combination and recombination of all of those sub things. Then we move to cyberspace, and I'm not saying internet, I'm saying cyberspace. Understand that um, the internet we have today, there will be more internets in the future. Uh, other countries around the world with different language structures and different alphabets do not find the, um, the, the alphabetic structure of the current in, uh, internet friendly. The current internet is totally vulnerable. It is completely non-secure. And so even uh, right now, the government is trying to build a more secure internet. So, you can just, so this is not about the internet. This is about cyberspace. And cyberspace is the ether, that virtual world, in which none of you in this room, I dare say, really has any clue about what is going on in the world with that. In Korea, the majority of young women spend more than half of their waking hours in Psy World. The majority of young men spend more than half of their waking hours in Cart Driver. These are two virtual worlds where people actually live. In Japan, there are young people called Hikikomori who stay in their room for 15 years and do not come out because they're in the virtual world. The currency that is scaring China most is virtual currency because so many people are in virtual worlds and using virtual currency that they have no clue what to do about it. Um, and so we look at cyberspace and we realize that there are enormous opportunities there that companies don't even get. For example, if I were to define virtual reality, and in our shop we define virtual reality as tricking the brain into believing that it's somewhere else doing something else in real time. If you were able to totally trick your brain and we can't do it now because we don't have the digitization of the sense of olfaction down pat and the olfactory sense, um, which is the only part of your brain that extends into the external universe is the olfactory part. That is the one that most anchors you in reality, whether you know it or not. So until we get that down um, to be able to digitize that and trans uh, transmit that well, we won't totally trick our brain. But if we can trick our brain into believing that we own a Ferrari and we are driving it through the streets of Monte Carlo, and we are with our friends, are we? <laughs> because if your brain believes it, honey, you are. We all live in our own realities anyway. And if your brain believes it, and if you are, then do you need to actually own the Ferrari? Do you need to actually travel to Monte Carlo? There will be people that still want to do those things, but the fact is we can remain a very highly consumptive society and not leave any carbon trail in what we're consuming because it's all in our heads. So when we talk to a lot of companies that are involved in brands, we just really encourage them to understand that in this new world, you have to be virtual as well as real in many ways. And of course, a lot of people are already working in virtual space. They have, um, they're working with teams everywhere on the, around the world together. Uh, there are companies that have actually promulgated dress codes for, for their avatars, their employees in, in virtual worlds. So that's cyberspace. And then we move on to design space. And we know that design is, is going to become one of the most important leverageable differentiators. And I don't mean design in the way, just some, the way something looks. The more we understand about the brain and inner space, the more we're going to know that we are multi, multi-sensory beings. We think we have five senses. Some people will give it a sixth and call it intuition. We also have many other senses we don't um, classify there, we have a sense of direction, we have a sense of time, we have a sense of balance, we have a sense of fear. 
And when we use our senses, we use them in combinations that are unique. So we basically have a million senses, and that is what we smell, what we hear, what we touch, what we, not just what we see. Um, and so design of everything, from not just the product and service that you're using, but also even, I mean, your telephone messaging mach machines, I'm sure every one of you, if somebody calls, they're going to get, you know, hi, this is Joe Schmo. I'm not here right now, but I would love to hear from you. Please leave a message after the tone. That is not designed. That's by default. Everything, everything will have to be designed in the future. Customer service. There should be no such thing as customer service. There should not exist anything that is called customer service because that is designed as a cost center. It should be after marketing. You should be treating your existing customers to everything that you're offering and more to your new customers. But what happens is just the reverse. New customers who've never done business with you get all the breaks and the customers that have been with you for 20 years don't get them. And that's totally reversed of what it should be because it costs a lot less to keep a, comp a customer than to go out and get a new one. So that has to be completely redesigned. So design means everything. So that's design space. Then we go to green to blue space. Um, and that is the movement from doing green to being green to blue. Doing green gives you no more points anymore. Everybody's supposed to do green. You're supposed to recycle this. You're not supposed to waste that. Big deal. You can't advertise it, just do it. Then you move to being green, which is very, very tough for long time existing businesses because that means you have to re-engineer everything um, from the ground up so that you leave the smallest possible footprint that's negative water, carbon, whatever. And then you move all the way to blue, which is where the new ingenuity will come in, and that's putting back more than you took. And companies that can explore their blue options in the future will be in much better shape. How do you do that? Well, there, for example, is a social entrepreneur that I met last year who buys up abandoned, blighted, polluted, urban um, plots of land and uh, all the real estate around it is depressed in very, you know, in jobless areas. And he plants sunflower seeds because sunflowers grow in any kind of crap. So he plants sunflower seeds and these fields become beautiful. The real estate around them rises in value and he employs people to sell the sunflowers at market and the components of sunflowers are very, lend themselves very well to um, biofuels without using any other um, otherwise arable land to do that. So that's blue. Ecotexture is blue. Um, Ecotexture is, um, how to describe this? If you, can, um, if you can take a spruce tree and bring it inside and instead of growing to 75 feet, you can train it to be nine inches, then you can grow a park bench. Then you can grow a house. Um, you can grow things without manufacturing them, and that is a game changer, and there are lots of interesting avenues to pursue there. So I could go on and on about green to blue, but that's, the, and then there is, um, I think the last one, I think I, did I cover seven? Um, inner space, outer space, micro space, cyberspace, design space, green to blue space, and the last one, I jokingly say is closet space, <laughs> but it's storage space. The private storage business is the fastest growing business in this country, really. And um, we're running out of room to store things in our brain. We're running out of room to store data. I mean, GE, for example, is working on a three-dimensional chip, uh, excuse me, a holographic chip to store data. We're running out of um, room to store e-waste. The electronics industry was the most polluting ever on the face of this planet. We keep tossing away electronic stuff that's perfectly good but outdated, and we are running out of room everywhere for this junk. We ship it to China, and then we're shocked that it comes back to us in toys. Um, so um, we have to figure that out. We have to figure out nuclear waste um, storage if we're really going to uh, seriously uh, go down that path. Um, so um, storage space um, is a really big issue. Um, so that's it, I think. <laughs>